Would you pray with me? Lord, you are God, and may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing to you, O God. In Jesus' name, amen. I wasn't raised in a Christian home. My parents raised me with very traditional Chinese values. I usually have to explain that, but in this context, I don't. But let me, let me just fill you in in case we have some few uh, people who might not know what that is. Three things. Obey your parents, do well in school, and practice piano. I didn't fit in with the other American boys. I looked different, I acted different, but I had this secret that I kept hidden through high school, college, even the Marine Corps reserves. In my early 20s, I no longer kept it a secret, and I came out of the closet and began living openly as a gay man in the gay community. So I decided to go home and break the news to my parents, and I told them, I am gay. Devastated my mom. She thought that an ultimatum could bring me to my senses. Tiger mom. And she said, you must either choose the family or choose that. She couldn't even say the words. Well, for me, this is not a choice. This is who I am. Left home, went back to Louisville. Through that crisis, my mother came to faith. And then within a few months, my father did as well. Well, I went the total opposite direction, wanted nothing to do with their newfound religion. I spent most of my free time in the gay clubs. I went from relationship to relationship seeking intimacy and happiness, which I found, but it still left me feeling unfulfilled and unsatisfied. So I began experimenting with drugs. And to be really clear, not all gays and lesbians do drugs. Some do, some don't. I'm just telling my story, not telling everyone else's story. But I also want to tell you that when you encounter Christ, he's going to impact every aspect of your life. So I began experimenting with drugs, but drugs cost money. If I was going to do drugs, I needed to support my habit. And I did that by selling drugs. And I sold to friends, classmates, even a professor. See, I actually thought I could live this double life of being a graduate student by day and a promiscuous drug dealer by night. But three months before I was received my doctorate, the administration of the school expelled me. So my parents flew from Chicago, where we were from. I was born and raised in Chicago to Louisville, where I was going to dental school. And I thought they were going to fight to keep me in school. My dad's a dentist. He knew the dean of the school really well. All they needed to do was to threaten a lawsuit, and I would stay in school for three months and get my doctorate. Besides, isn't that what any good Asian parent should do anyway? To my surprise, as we sat there in the dean's office, my mom told the dean, it's not important that Christopher becomes a dentist. What's more important is that Christopher becomes a Christ follower. Talk about radical transformation. See, my Chinese mom knew that it is not important whether her kid gets a degree or a doctorate, but what's more important is that her children follow Jesus. The sad reality is In many of our Asian contexts, people might go to church on Sunday, worship God, but then they'll return home and worship idols, the idol of education, the idol of career, the idol of their 401k. In essence, we force youth to do the same. Think about this. Our Asian parents putting more emphasis upon their children getting their homework done, getting a better grade, getting into a good school, all good things. Or should Christian, Asian Christian parents be putting more emphasis, actually the most emphasis upon following Jesus? It's no wonder why many of our youth grow up in church, go off to Ivy League, great top schools, and they leave their faith behind because maybe... They weren't actually really worshiping God in the first place. Nothing is more important than following Christ. But if I could be totally blunt with you, I was not happy about my mom's decision because she wasn't on my side, I felt. She was on the school side. So I moved further away from them, further away from Chicago to the bright lights and big city of Atlanta, Georgia. And there I quickly took over the drug scene in the gay community and I became a supplier to other dealers in over a dozen states. In addition, it was nothing made of multiple anonymous sexual encounters each and every day. Because according to the world, I had it all. Money, fame, drugs, and sex. I had exchanged the truth of God for a lie. 
and I began worshiping and serving the creature rather than the creator. Because in my world, I had become God. My parents had no clue that I was doing drugs, but they knew my biggest need was to know Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. So they tried to reach out to me the love of Christ, and I wanted nothing to do with it. They came to visit me one time in Atlanta, and I told them to get out. The interesting thing was they were not preaching at me. They were not telling me I was living in sin. I knew what they believed. But just the fact that God had so radically transformed their lives that they radiated Christ, that was offensive to me. And I told him to leave. Before my dad left, he gave me his very first Bible. It was all dog-eared, notes in the margins, and I told my dad, I don't want your Bible. Left it on my kitchen counter anyway, walked out the door. As soon as they left, took my dad's Bible, and I threw it in the trash can. I wanted nothing to do with God, and certainly nothing to do with the Bible. And after that visit, it was more than obvious to my parents that I was hopeless. But my dad and mom committed not to focus upon hopelessness, but upon the promises of God. And along with over a hundred prayers, prayer warriors from church, from their Bible study fellowship group, they began to cry out to God for me. My mom began to pray a bold prayer. God, do whatever it takes to bring this prodigal son to you. That's a bold prayer for a mom. That's a bold prayer for an Asian mom to make. But in her desperation, she fasted every Monday for seven years and once fasted 39 days on my behalf. She would spend hours, hours every morning in her prayer closet, reading the Bible, on her knees, crying out to God, interceding for me, for many, many others. She knew that it was going to take nothing short of a miracle to bring this prodigal son to the Father. And a miracle is exactly what God did. This miracle came with a bang on my door. Open up my door. On my doorstep were 12 federal drug enforcement agents, Atlanta police, and two big German shepherd dogs. I just received a large shipment of drugs, not my largest, but they confiscated all my money, my drugs, and I was charged with the equivalent of 9.1 tons of marijuana. Legal here in California, right? <laughs> with that amount, I was facing 10 years to life in federal prison. I had started with a bright future among society's finest in academia, and I found myself in the ditch among society's despised in the Lattice City Detention Center. So I tried calling home, dreading making that phone call, just imagining the earful that I was going to get on the other line. But mom's first words were, son, are you okay? No condemnation, no berating words, just words of unconditional love and grace. The apostle Paul says in Romans chapter two, verse four, that it's God's kindness that leads us to repentance. Notice how Paul did not choose to say that it's God's anger. It's not God's wrath, but it's God's kindness that leads us to repentance. And even on that miserable day, God was pouring out his grace and drawing me to himself through the words of my mother. Actually, my, my mom was excited to get that phone call if you can believe it or not because <laughs> i hadn't called home in years and she knew without a doubt that this was god's answer to her prayers so she hung up that phone fighting back the tears she knew she had to do like that good old hymn says count your blessings 
name them one by one. No matter what storm she was going through, she had to count her blessings. She set the phone down. Next to the phone was a, a calculator. And she tore off a little piece of the adding machine tape from the calculator, and she wrote down these first blessings. Christopher is, is in a safe place <laughs> compared to before. And he called home for the very first time. As my years in prison passed, she kept adding to this list and counting her blessings. And when I got out of prison, this list of blessings was longer and taller than she is. Both sides. Three days later, I was walking around the cell block and I passed by this garbage can and I looked at this and I'm like, this is my life. I'm from upper middle class suburb of Chicago. My dad has two doctorates. I was only three months away from receiving my own doctorate. I had it made. But now I found myself among common criminals. Trash. With my head down, I was about to pass by this garbage can. Something on top of the trash caught my eye. I bent over, picked it up. And it was a Gideon's New Testament. Took the New Testament back to my cell. I opened up that good book. For the first time, I read through the entire gospel of Mark that night. But let me tell you, I was not thinking this is the answer. I just thought that I've got a ton of time on my hands and a better pass it somehow. But as we know, what we have in our Bibles is not just ink on paper. But what we have In our Bibles, ladies and gentlemen, is the very breath of God. And it is living and powerful and sharper than any double-edged sword, able to cut through the hardest of hearts, exposing my sin, my rebellion, and it wasn't a pre-sight, and I thought things were going to get worse. I was wrong. A couple weeks later, I was called into the nurse's office. She sat me down, shut the door behind me, and I knew something wasn't right. She was uncomfortably struggling with the words. She couldn't even give me eye contact. So she wrote something on a piece of paper, slowly slid it across the desk to me. I looked down, and I saw three letters and a symbol. It read H. IV positive. The days after were dark and lonely. I was sentenced to six years, much better than 10 years to life that I was facing. But news of my HIV status felt like a death sentence. One night I was laying in my bed Look up at the cold metal bunk above me. Somebody scribbled something and it read, if you're bored, read Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. See, at the most hopeless point in my life, the Lord God who is using the words penned by a prophet thousands of years ago to a rebellious nation in Israel to tell me that if God could have a plan for Israel in rebellion, in exile, he could even have a plan for me. I had no clue where that plan was going to take me, but God gave me enough faith, enough strength to get through that one day and the next and the next. My transformation was gradual. God was convicting me of my idols, which were many. The most obvious was drugs. But within a few months, he delivered me from that addiction. God kept bringing to mind other idols, and there was just this one thing that I felt like I just couldn't let go of, my sexuality. So we went to a chaplain, and I asked him his opinion. I'm a brand new Christian. I don't know very much about the Bible. And I'm thinking, I got to ask someone who's studied the Bible, who's gone to cemetery, seminary, <laughs> the chaplain. <laughs> to my surprise, this chaplain actually told me the Bible does not 
condemn homosexuality. And he even gave me a book explaining that view. And I'm like, great, I can have my cake and eat it too. I took that book in the hopes of finding biblical justification for homosexuality. I had that book in one hand, the Bible in the other. Can I just tell you, from a purely human perspective, I had every single reason in the world to accept what that book is claiming, to justify the way I had been living. But God's indwelling Holy Spirit convicted me that those assertions from that book were a clear distortion of God, his word, and his unmistakable condemnations against same-sex relationships. I couldn't even finish that book, and I gave it back to the chaplain, which meant I turned to the Bible alone. And I went through every verse, every chapter, every page of scripture looking for justification. I wanted to find any shred of evidence, any verse that might bless a monogamous same-sex relationship. So I went through the whole Bible. I went cover to cover several times. I had time. I looked and I looked and I looked and I couldn't find any. So I was at a turning point, a crossroads. Either abandon God and his word live as a gay man, pursue a monogamous same-sex relationship by allowing my attractions, get this, by allowing my sexual attractions to dictate not only who I was, but also how I lived. Or abandon pursuing a monogamous same-sex relationship, how? By freeing myself from my sexuality, by not allowing my desires to control who I am, and live as a follower of Jesus Christ. By God's grace, I followed Jesus. As the days and the weeks and the months of abstinence passed, I realized that my sexuality should not be, does not have to be the core of who I am. I told myself before, God loves me unconditionally. True, right? But don't we as sinners like to add to God's truth? I added, so therefore God doesn't want me to change. Similar to your friends who say, God loves me just the way I am, so leave me alone. But after reading the Bible, I learned that unconditional love is not the same thing as unconditional approval of my behavior. Let me say it again. Unconditional love is not the same thing as unconditional approval of my behavior. My identity should not be defined by my sexuality. My identity shouldn't be grounded in my desires. My identity is not gay. It's not ex-gay. It's not even heterosexual for that matter because my identity as a child of the living God must be in Jesus Christ alone. God says, be holy, for I am holy. You know, before I had become a Christian, I thought that if I were to become a Christian, I had become a heterosexual. And what does that mean? Well, I need to be sexually attracted to the opposite sex. As a matter of fact, I even thought that the more sexually attracted I were to lots and lots of women, the more of a Christian man I would be. <laughs> but I realized that even if I had opposite sex attractions, I would still need to flee, t flee temptation and resist sin. So heterosexuality, right direction, but not the right goal. And if you think about this, God never commands us, be heterosexual for I am heterosexual. But neither did he say, be homosexual for I am homosexual. They're the wrong secular Freudian categories. Instead, God said, be holy for I and holy. Therefore, the opposite of homosexuality is not heterosexuality. That's not the right goal, but the opposite of homosexuality is holiness. As a matter of fact, the opposite of any sin struggle is holiness. I don't need to focus upon whether I'm struggling or tempted. I just need to focus upon living a life of holiness and living a life of purity because change is not the absence of temptations. God doesn't promise you that you won't be tempted when you come to Christ. Jesus was tempted in every way. But change is the spirit wrought ability to be holy even in the midst of temptations because the ultimate issue is not whether I'm struggling, not whether I'm tempted, but the ultimate issue is that I yearn after God in total surrender and complete obedience. 
As I began to live this life of surrender and obedience, God began to reveal his plan for my life, and he called me to full-time vocational ministry while I was in prison, of all places. And I realized that no matter where I was, whether I was in prison or out of prison, because my call to ministry would remain the same, regardless of the location. And with that change of heart, God did another miracle, shortened my prison sentence from six years to three years, which is almost unheard of in the federal system. So if only, only about a year left my prison sentence, I knew if I was going to continue on a ministry after prison, I needed to learn more about the Bible. So I called them to collect my parents. I told them, I think God's calling me to ministry. Ask them to mail me an application to Moody Bible Institute. But there was silence on the other line because I think they both dropped their phones. <laughs> they mailed the application into me to prison. I was really excited when I got it, tore it open, began filling it out until I got to the last page where they asked me for references. Not from anybody. These had to be people who knew me as a Christian for at least one year. I had some slim pickings in prison. <laughs> but I was able to persuade a prison chaplain, a prison guard, and another prison inmate to write my reference to Moody. So amazingly, I actually was accepted. Released from prison, <laughs> July of, amen, Praise the Lord. I was released from prison July of 2001, started the very next month in August of 2001. So imagine the surprise of my classmates when I answered their question, what did you do this summer? <laughs> I graduated from Moody 2005, went on to my master's in exegesis 2007, received my doctorate of ministry 2014, and then in 2011, I had the really cool privilege of co-authoring a book with my mom called Out of a Far Country, a gay son's journey to God, a broken mother's search for hope. She wrote chapter one, I wrote chapter two. She wrote, chap she wrote all, all, the odd, all the odd chapters, I wrote the even chapters, because we wanted to tell you from her own voice how you can have the same situation told from two totally different perspectives, a parent, a prodigal, and the best part is how God in his power and his grace brought us all back together. This book actually is now being used as a textbook in many Christian schools. Like, who would have thought our testimony would be a textbook, but our youth are being flooded, inundated with resources on sexuality, all from a non-Christian worldview. And, and, I mean, the Bible uses narrative to communicate theology, and actually it makes sense. We're using our narrative to communicate the beauty of biblical sexuality, and so people are using that and using it with their kids, engaging them with the story and co communicating biblical sexuality with it. We have a free eight-week discussion guide in the back of that book that people are using, parents are using with like eight years old on up, because I know a lot of times, especially the Asian, we're like, when is it too early, you know? You know or when is it too early to talk to my kids about sex? Not the right question. The right question is, when is it too late? If kids in kindergarten and pre-K are already hearing about two mommies, you know, two daddies, you could be either boy or girl, whatever you feel like, we must be ahead of the ball. But you might think, I don't know what to say. So my newest book, Holy Sexuality and the Gospel, um, came out in 2019. It was uh, actually named 2020 Book of the Year for Social Issues by Outreach Magazine. And there's a lot of good books out there on sexuality, many of them going through the important biblical texts. But sometimes our message on sexuality goes something like this. Don't do this, don't do that, don't do this. Important. But we can't build a Christian life on God's no. If our message to our youth is don't do this, don't do that, is that setting them up for life. What's God's yes? Chastity and singleness or faithfulness in marriage. Chastity and singleness or faithfulness in marriage. Not heterosexuality, not homosexuality, not bisexuality. It's the wrong framework. Let's use the biblical framework. Holy sexuality, either chastity and singleness or faithfulness in marriage. And that is good news for all. With all the good books out there on sexuality, I realized that there were very few doing, I mean, there was a lot doing some, kind of some exegetical work and then some good, you know, some practical ministry books, but very few that was actually approaching sexuality through the lens of systematic theology and biblical theology. And so that was my hope, writing a book on a theology of sexuality. And at the very beginning of my book, I actually begin on this talk on identity. 
Because I think if there's one thing that I believe the church is missing today when it comes to sexuality and understanding the LGBT community, understanding the world that our kids are living in, we don't fully grasp how sexuality has become who a person is. I mean, identity is an important question. Who am I? We all ask ourselves that question. If you are Asian American, you have asked that yourself that question. I grew up, am I Chinese? I mean, all my white friends told me, you're not American, you're Chinese. And then the first time I went to China in my teen years, everyone then there said, you're not Chinese, who am I? Midlife crisis, I'm 52. Midlife crisis, is that not an identity crisis? Empty nest syndrome, that's an identity crisis for some Self-identity is shaped by family, friends, or culture. Others is shaped by work. I'm a lawyer. Or by sports. I'm a football player. Or hobbies. I'm a gamer. Still others find their soul identity in their sexuality. Yet do these substitutes actually describe who we are or what we do and what we experience? And specifically, should sexuality describe who we are or something else? And you might think, well, what does it matter? I mean, tomato, tomato, how you define yourself. Well, actually, how we answer this question, who am I, actually has huge ramifications. It affects how we think. It affects the choices we make. It affects the relationships we build. If you say, I'm a gamer, is that not going to affect how you think? Is that not going to affect the choices you make? Is that not going to affect what you're thinking about throughout the whole day, even the relationships that we build? Who am I? How we answer that question has enormous consequences. This is not just a minor issue. Our thoughts and our actions are influenced at some level, and I would argue at a great level, by how we answer this question, which shows this really close relationship between essence and ethics. Let me break this down. Essence, who we are, impacts how we live. Ethics. You know what's interesting is there is this complex cyclical nature of it. Therefore, the opposite is true. How we live, ethics, impacts who we are. Essence. So if we have a flawed view of who you are, you're going to have a flawed view of how you live. If you have a flawed view of how we live, your personal ethic, you're going to have a flawed view of who we are. Personhood affects practice. Practice affects personhood. See, when I lived as a gay man years ago, my whole world was gay. You know, the culture likes to talk about the LGBTQ plus community. There actually isn't any LGBTQ monolithic group. I mean, even the L and the, and the G, like, yeah, I had some, you know, token lesbian friends, but mainly because they liked the gay clubs. 99% of all my friends were gay men. All my friends were gay. I lived in an apartment complex in Midtown Atlanta that was 95% gay men. Not lesbian, 95% gay men. I worked out at a gay gym. I bought my groceries at what we nicknamed the Gay Kroger. I bought my new sports car at a gay car dealer. My, My housekeeper was gay. My bookkeeper was gay. Everyone and everything around me affirmed what my flesh was screaming. I am gay. You see, this goes beyond just kind of what is right and wrong behavior. I think it's more preliminary, way more preliminary than that. Being gay, even even the verb we use before the term gay, not feeling, not doing, but what verb do we use? Being. The verb of existence, the verb of essence, being gay. This error reveals a deeper philosophical and theological misunderstanding that actually points to our essence, the core of our being. People who identify as gay, that's exactly what they say. This is the core of my being, or even a part of who I am. Not a part of what we experience, that's true. 
but a part of who I am. See, this, in this conversation around, so being gay is no longer about what I'm attracted to, what I desire, or what I do. Being, being gay has wrongly become who I am. In this conversation around sexuality, this subtle shift from what, meaning what I do, what I feel, what I experience, what I desire, to who I am has created this radically distorted view of personhood. But honestly, if you think about it, I don't know of any other experience, any other desire, any other thought that we've made it who we are. I don't know of any other, I don't know of any sin behavior that we've made it who we are. So if you know, if you know someone who's a gossiper, you're a gossiper. When we say that, we don't mean that who he is. We mean that's what he does. So stop it. A liar. You're a liar. That's not who you are, but what you do. An adulteress. That's not who she is, but what she does. And yet, when it comes to the term gay... It is no longer meaning what a person desires, but it has become who a person is. So should sexuality be who we are? The term gay, straight, bi, is that really describing who we are? Do those terms actually describe person or actually describe our experience? So actually, sexuality should not be who we are, but how we are. And when we make that error, could that actually then distort how we think, how we live, and even the relationships that we build? You see, the terms heterosexual, homosexual, bisexual, gay, straight, bi, turn desire into personhood experience into ontology. So now experience reigns supreme. So it's no longer sola scriptura, but today it's sola experientia, experience alone. So who am I? Who are you? Who are we? When it comes to understanding human sexuality, how do we better understand that? So if this, that's not if that's not who we are, then who are we? You see, to, to actually properly, we cannot properly understand human sexuality unless we begin here. Where? Unless we begin with theological anthropology. And since I'm talking to people, my brothers and sisters who are in ministry, I'm expecting, I'm kind of, we're raising the bar here on understanding with theology and stuff. Theological anthropology, big word, but it's quite simple. Anthropology is the study of humanity. Theological anthropology is the study of humanity through the lens of Scripture. And it's, we're created in the image of God, but we're also fallen. And when we begin there, that actually really helps us to better understand human sexuality. So how? Here's a few things. First, beginning with theological anthropology actually rebukes the arrogant condemner. You might know people like that. You might have relatives, maybe your uncle or people in our churches. They look down their nose at those gay people. They're ruining our country. I mean, what else needs to be said? It's a sin. They're created in the image of God. Regardless of anyone's sex, age, ethnicity, regardless of whether someone is in submission to God or not, regardless of someone has opposite sex attractions, same sex attractions, both or none, everyone is created in the Imago Dei. And it's inherent to who we are, it's never erased. So when we say that people should be treated with dignity and respect, it's not because of our commitment to social justice or human rights, but it's mainly because we're, we're doing it because every human being is created in the image of God. Every person is endowed with inestimable value and dignity and should be treated with dignity and respect. Actually, the Imago Dei is the only true foundation for justice which is an indictment to Christians who might mock and demonize 
individuals in the gay community, or even Christians who experience same-sex temptations. Such hurtful actions actually fail to honor those created in the image of God, and it actually forsakes the believer's calling to reflect the image of Christ and then proclaim the good news to those who have yet to believe. Second, theological anthropology also helps us to avoid a common incorrect diagnosis. If you're not feeling well, you want the doctor to diagnose you correctly. What are your symptoms? And give you correct diagnosis. A correct diagnosis leads to a correct treatment. But honestly, I think for decades, we have diagnosis incorrectly. For example, many of you may have heard something like this before. The root causes of homosexuality are, or same-sex attractions are, an absentee father, dominant mother, or abuse in one's childhood. Now, certainly those things in our childhood have has detrimental effects on an individual, especially abuse. But is that a root cause? Are things in our childhood the cause for making us sinners? When we go to the Word of God, the Word of God tells something different. Because rooting our problems that are only root is in our childhood and nothing else, that's not biblical, that's Freudian. And sometimes in our churches and even in our Asian churches, we are more busy chasing after Freud than Jesus. Where even sometimes ordination of pastors or calling a pastor, they're more experienced because they are more experienced in psychology than the Bible. Not saying that, but that, that, that is not a good thing, but they look to that as the only way to be trained without any Bible grounding. So these can be influences, but what's the root cause? Correct diagnosis. Beginning, we're created in the image of God, but we're also fallen. Because looking at scripture, we see that this is sin. And what's the root cause of sinful behavior? Our sin nature. It's our sin nature. And as simple as that might seem, it's not simple. I mean, it has implications in everything. It's our sin nature. And if sin is the problem, then Christ is the answer and the body of Christ is the answer. So we need to see that that's, it's an incorrect diagnosis and have the correct diagnosis when we begin with theological anthropology. Third, it helps us, theological anthropology rejects sin as a categorical error. So the other one was diagnosing it incorrectly with it's not the root causes in our childhood, but root cause is my sin nature. But that view has also kind of made heterosexuality as the goal and orientation as the main goal, which is the wrong view for cure. It's not cure of our orientation, but what we need to seek the cure for, for our sin nature. But the other kind of pendulum has swung now with where we have kind of embraced the issue as sin and our sin nature as the correct way to view this. See, we're not quibbling over just terms. See, this actually completely misunderstands the whole kind of debate that's embroiled in our denomination right now, denominations right now. I think as I read all that's out there, we're completely missing. It's not over terminology. Is this a non-essential doctrinal issue? The issue is repentance, or unrepentance, sanctification, or indwelling sin? Are we actually condoning and celebrating something that Scripture is telling us to say we need to speak into? Now, now, I'm not talking about not caring for people. Certainly, what I'm talking about is not tone. Our tone, my parents did not win me over like this. They won me over like this. 
God's kindness leads to repentance. So it's not about tone, but it's about telos. It's about what is the end, what is the goal? What does sanctification, I mean, is sanctification just a trivial matter that we can just agree to disagree? That's what it's about. Is sanctification just a, well, you can have your view and I can have my view, you know? Unrepentance, is that an agree to disagree issue? It's about embracing, are we going to embrace and celebrate unrepentance or not? Charles Spurgeon, I mean, we can't have any quote, you know, sermon without quoting Charles Spurgeon. He said one of my favorite quotes, and it's this. Listen up. Discernment is not knowing the difference between right and wrong. It's knowing the difference between right and almost right. Our kids can see what is right or wrong. Discernment means we can discern between right and and almost right, because I think this understanding defines sin too narrowly, because you're like, well, but these people are, they're not acting on it. So is sexual immorality only the act? Is sexual immorality just don't do it? What does Jesus say in Matthew 5, the Sermon on the Mount? If a man looks lustfully after woman, He's already committed adultery. And so when we say that, oh, that same-sex attraction, there's nothing sinful about it. And I don't like that term temptation or same-sex attraction. In my book, I, I tease it out with desire and attraction. Attraction in itself is not actual sin, but it's rooted in our sin nature. But the desire, we have this misunderstanding that desire turns into lust. If you study the biblical languages, you know that in Hebrew, chama, hamad means actually it's the 10th commandment. Do not covet. It's the same word for desire. Epithumia in Greek is the word for desire that we actually translate to lust. So actually, desire does not turn into lust. Wrongly ordered desire is lust. And again, we need to do this pastorally and with care, but I'm talking about telos, the end. We're not going to hit people over the head. We're not going to tell them you can't do this and can't do that, but we're going to say you need to do this. Christ is our telos. Christ is our end. But also, we're defining sexuality too broadly to the point where someone could say, if I don't have same-sex attractions, I'm still gay. There are so many aspects of my, you know, my whole person that is gay. You know, my, I see another person and that's, you know, my desire for friendship for people, someone of the same sex is part of my sexuality. If that were true, my mom is bisexual. We need to be very careful about how we define things so we don't blur the lines. And lastly, beginning with theological anthropology helps us to, under, to, helps us to answer the born gay question. Am I born this way? I mean, don't all our youth, that's what they, you know, that's what their te teachers are teaching them. People are just born this way. But actually looking at all the research, and, and I have a video on my YouTube channel where you can look at that, is being gay genetic, you can look at that. All the research, nothing's conclusive. But the Bible doesn't say anything about this. Not true. That even though people think they're born gay, Jesus says this, you must be born again. The old is gone. The new has come. In Christ, your new creation. That is not a message just for the gay community. That is a message for the whole world. You may have thought that you just heard a Chinese guy come up here and tell his testimony but a man who used to identify as gay and no longer does. That's true. But that's actually not my testimony. Let me tell you my testimony. I once was blind, and now I see. I once was lost, and now I'm found. I once did not believe and now I believe in the Son of God, and his name is Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for Jesus. Lord, help us 
In all of our ministry contexts, whether ordained or not, Lord, we are the holy priesthood. Lord, help us to lift up Jesus high. Help us, Lord, to love you more than life, for it is the matchless name of your son, Jesus, that we pray. And the people of God said, amen.